Welcome to Wyoming Web Ed Radio. This is James Capti, Wyoming teacher and buckaroo for our ride today. I got Joe Schroer, human lead, human learning and assessment expert and UW professor, riding side saddle with me today. How you doing, Joe? Doing real good, James. Hey, James, it's, if, it, if it's okay, I'll tell you, I'm doing great. And one of the reasons is this morning we had our first synchronous Zoom meeting for uh, the Wyoming uh, K-12 Digital Teaching and Learning week-long workshop. This was the first week, and we're basically, we're training teachers. This is Maya and I, other co-hosts here, other side saddle partner. Uh, we're, we're training trainers across the state of Wyoming and all the different districts um, in digital teaching and learning and different ideas. And I just wanted to give a shout out for that because we still have a couple spots available, uh, August 17th, the week of August 17th. And if anybody out there wants to get involved with this, we got a few spots. Uh, just search within the Wyoming Department of Ed, professional development, or contact your uh, district office. So just throwing that out there, James. It's a great day. Wow. What, what a way to dive into this ride. We're just like coming right out of the chute on a buck and bronc. So, Joe, let's take a second and mask up. What's your feeling on mask and schools? Ooh. Well, man, I tell you... Um, you know, we, we have to mask up at so many different places, you know, um, lots of places that I don't even want to be in contact with people, you know, but in schools, I want to be in contact with kids. I, you know, how do, how do you bring kindergartners to school and not give hugs, right? Or teach uh, speech language pathology without, you know, showing people how to, how to enunciate in different parts of the mouth and so on. So, I mean, I know we got to, you know, we got to treat the, the school just like we would maybe a, a, a hospital or something like that and, and maybe uh, give it that, that kind of uh, attention it deserves. But man, working with kids, we got to have those connections. What do you say, James? Well, as I'm sitting here looking at you, it's pretty hard to judge facial expressions. And I mean, we're going to have to get really good at our eyes, but uh, uh, facial expressions are a big, big part of what how we interact with kids. So it's going to be a new learning process for us to, to understand those, uh, what, how kids are relating to what we're saying. But you're right, the safety of it all, uh, I want to be in school and I, I want to be around kids and, and I want them to be with us. So I guess we adapt and move on. So, well, enough of this owl-headedness. Let's get this show on the dirt road. Head them up. And move them out. Wild web ed, here we come. Oh, what a, a cow, we have a Thunder Nation size announcement. We need you to share your questions as they arise via the Zoom chat or post them on YouTube. And, and we have a couple extra special guests joining us in a few weeks. Governor Mark Gordon and State Superintendent Jillian Bale. Oh, them doggies are real special guests. Hey, James, I got a question. I got a question. This is for the superintendent. Here we go. I hear she's a co-chair of the Women's Antelope Hunt, and she and, gotta watch out there, and she and the First Lady are avid hunters and have been proponents of allowing wild game to be donated, right? Um, so this is Wyoming, right? Do you think we're gonna see wild game in the school cafeteria soon? Can I ask that kind of question? That's a great question. Whatever question our teachers out there have, uh, let their voices be heard. I think that's a great question. I mean, it, it add a little flavor to what we're serving in the lunchroom. So uh, it could be wild game budgets. It could be COVID. It could be anything. So just make sure your voices are heard and make sure you look for that link. And, and we, want, we want to ask your questions. So let us, let us help you. So let's give a Wyoming web ed welcome to Rachel Watson, Director of Learning Active Mentoring Program, or LAMP, as it's more commonly known, as part of our top tier science initiative at the University of Wyoming. In the 2019-20 academic year, 79 LAMP trained educators at UW impacted 5,000 plus students in 127 active learning classes. She's a senior lecturer in chemistry and has her hands in several other programs in the area, including microbiology. So we are so excited in this germ time to have a biologist with us. Hi, Rachel. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the show today. It's an honor to be here. Oh, so 
Rachel, one of my favorite teaching jobs was being right across from the foods lab in, in the high school and getting to judge all the creations they made. Maybe it wasn't perfect for, for my waist, but I loved it. So with virtual labs, how do we get kids real experiences? Oh, this is a great question. And sometimes a virtual lab, actually, James, can be more meaningful to a student than the kinds of labs that we usually have. So, um, for example, we tend to put students in the lab and we tell them, hey, now imagine how this would work in real life or how this would work in nature. And we're now in a, a moment, I say, let no good crisis go to waste, where we can change that up a little bit and we can actually say, uh, now go out in nature nature or in your real life and imagine how people do this in the lab, how they think up ways um, to make it work in a lab environment. So in some ways this can liberate us and in fact you mentioned food sciences. One of my lamp trained professors teaches food science and this last semester she actually gave her students permission to do their labs in their own kitchens and they made some incredible creations, some very tasty sausages I hear um, and unusual things and she was stunned by the creativity that they showed and the ownership of their own process rather than having the lab be kind of cookbook style for them they put their own touch to it so virtual labs just that term has kind of a different meaning I think of a virtual lab putting on some glasses I'm reaching into imaginary world but how do, how do you define virtual labs Yes, thank you for asking about that because I think so many people think only about simulations, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and that's one of maybe five types of labs at a distance that we can do. There are also, as I mentioned, the kitchen lab possibilities, the outdoor lab possibilities, and of course we can have kits or delivery. Some of our Riverton um, teachers this last summer actually took door to door. They delivered things to their students, including auger plates for the students to cough on and see the microbial communities growing on them. And then, of course, we can have video labs, too, so we can give them a little window um, into the, the real lab. And I see Joe covering up his mask, mouth with his mask. And this is actually a cool thing, too, because in the lab, we wouldn't want to have a bunch of students coughing on a plate um, in this current time. So in their homes, they can feel safe to do that. Right on, right on. Hey, you know, Rachel, it really does not surprise me to hear about, you know, Wyoming teachers getting out, delivering kits to students so that, you know, uh, you know, just Wyoming teachers getting out, going the extra mile, um, you know, for kids to be able to, uh, you know, ex have these experiences, you know. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about um, how, do, how do you make connections in a virtual lab, you know, because I'm used to, you know, being elbow to elbow with somebody, you know, titrating solids, liquids, gases, whatever you titrate, and then, you know, building relationships with my, my, my peers, you know, how do we, how do we do that with a virtual lab, though? This is a really good question, because we tend to think about a particular type of human connection that we get when we're in a face-to-face -face environment. And those are really valuable. They're very important. But also when we're doing things virtually, there's a whole new door open to us for a different kind of connection. Once students have done a lab in their home, they can actually go public with what they found. And maybe what they've done is different, right? That student who made homemade sausages and did his own fermentation at home, his experiment was different than his neighbor's experiment or his co um, co-peer, his, his peer who might be, you know, in a completely different location, and they could share based upon their unique environment, they could share that work. So now we open up the possibility for collaboration being true team science, where students can share from their unique niche with another student from that person's unique niche. Um, so, hey, right, along with our Riverton teacher example, we saw that students in different home environments might see different microorganisms growing on their place and they could compare those and we, we came together with them with our virtual roadshow team and we helped them to look at their plates and talk about why they might be different in those different home environments. So it opens up that possibility, Joe. Wow, wow. This sounds a lot like personalized learning. We've talked about personalized learning on here before, but this sounds like 
you know, when, you, when we want to build student interest and motivation, um, allowing them to take, you know, what they have at home, and making making that work, you know that that sounds a lot like what you're doing here. Providing them the structure and template so that they can they can do these things on their own. The students can. Yes, very much so. It's allowing the students to create a very effective emotional connection with what they're doing. And we know that emotion, right, links to cognition. So if students are positively emotionally engaged, if we as teachers are positively emotionally engaged, then we're all thinking a little bit better and learning a whole lot more. So yeah, that personalization is absolutely huge to what we do. And I tell you, it's really huge to what we do with all of our roadshow endeavors is to ask our teachers and our students what it is in their community that they might be curious about or interested in and then we can design learning around that um, once again our Riverton, Riverton teachers saw that in their local um, environment there was an old landfill that the um, city officials and the Ingberg Miller engineers were working to clean up and they wanted to, to play a role in that. So sometimes labs can become becoming involved in your own community and thinking about the ways in which you can construct learning, right? Very personalized around solving those problems. And we came together in a very uh, cross community, cross disciplinary team to help to solve that problem or help present some possible solutions to that problem. Well, all I know is I get excited when I hear you talking about using technology in the mix of all of this connecting people, not just consuming, but actually getting people to share and connect and all those pieces, because that's, that's really the hidden, hidden value of technology in, in, in my opinion. So in our introduction, we've talked about these teachers that have been trained that have impacted over 5,000 students. We've, I have numbers that you, you guys have actually had a chance to work directly with over 3,600 students. I guess my question for all of our teachers out there, how do we, how do we, get you involved with us, but is there a cost involved? Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Lots and lots of questions uh, in that, James. Um, let's start with how you want to get connected with all of us who are part of the, the virtual resources that we're providing and building and building around your needs. And that's what's really important. Um, we're connecting personally with all of our teachers and our students and we're using their needs to drive what we do. So the easiest way to connect with our current resources is on the website. If you just go to Google and you just search for LAMP Virtual Roadshow, lots of resources out there. But important thing to know is that behind every one of those resources, there's a real person and that real person wants to come to your Zoom class or your outdoor class or whatever it is that is safe for us to do this um, this coming term. So we're, we're there, we're real people, we wanna come and we wanna visit you, but we also wanna be driven by your needs. So for example, one of our seventh graders in one of our Zoom sessions this summer asked about what's involved in getting a vaccine to, to COVID. And so now one of my um, undergraduate researchers has spent a good portion of his summer developing a whole kit of educational resources on, on our SARS-CoV-2 virus that will become accessible. And it's just driven by that one seventh grader student, seventh grade student's uh, question. Heck yeah, Rachel, I mean, you know, when I think of authentic learning environments here and, and building uh, just interest and, um, you know, student-driven questions, you know, that, that drive the curriculum. I mean, this is, this is what's happening here. And, you know, I see so many, when I go to the website, I see so many different examples of DNA extraction, night skies, garden chemistry. Do, do you, what about you, Rachel? Do you have a favorite activity here? I mean, I see you with the brain, right? And, and so forth. What, what's your favorite activity? Talk to me about an activity that you, that you really love. Oh, yeah, there's been so many amazing experiences this summer and all of them were somewhat unanticipated. But one of my favorites was that um, I realized that 
um, our students needed a great example for how to maintain a lab notebook when they're at home and how to do true science where you're actually reflectively writing down your hypotheses, your experimental protocols, your observations, data, and discussion. And so I have one of the virtual roadshows where I just do an at-home experiment where I streak uh, uh, microbial cultures from sourdough onto a potato slice and watch the colonies grow and I do the notebooking along with that so students can use that and teachers can use that and really anyone who wants to can use that to help you become more reflective in either your science or your gardening or your cooking um, but that notebooking process is is one that I feel I feel really uh, I guess I feel proud of that particular resource Thank you. So we, we have lots of teachers out there that are listening, and the question is, is this a K-5, a K-6, or maybe a high school? Who does this fit? Yeah, thank you for asking about that. We've done our best to help to link to some of the standards and, and outcomes that you all have across levels. And some of our videos are better for certain ages, and we can tailor our instruction to certain ages. But one of the most important things to me is to relate that um, the most valuable learning happens across levels. So our, in our mission statement, we truly, and we truly try to embody this all the way from kindergarten or pre-kindergarten through 109, right? Um, that that the, across, learning across the lifespan and learning together across the lifespan lifespan. So our project that I spoke a little bit about in Riverton is an example of that, where we actually had learners from across the lifespan. So our seventh graders drove the project and our seventh grade teachers, but then we came together with the Ingrid Miller engineers, the city officials, um, my undergraduate researchers in microbiology, graduate student researchers, faculty members, and I can tell you that every single one of us learned something in that process. So we we really do like to say that our resources are good for pre-K through 109 um, or beyond <laughs> if you make it that far. Um, so I hope that helps to answer that question, James. Um, help guide me if I got off track on any of the many questions that came there. <laughs> hey, when we're riding these horses, we just go wherever they go. We, there's no tracks. So my, my, my question to add to that is when we're talking about grade levels, this really seems like teachers just kind of contact you and then you work into there. It's not, oh, goodness, as a teacher, I have so much more to do. You're helping teachers out. Yes. That's, uh, that is such an important point. And we've often, I've often thought to myself, myself, especially when I go to Rock Springs and I see what our teachers there are doing, they're at school by like 6.30 a.m. and they're pedal to the metal, like speaking of riding hard, I mean, all day long. And so I've thought to myself, gosh, you know, the best thing we can do here is give our teachers what I like to call a spa day, which doesn't mean that they're getting the day off, but what it means is that they get to sit back and they get to truly appreciate the curiosity that their students have. They get to look around, um, they get to say, wow, I never knew that so-and-so was taking notes when I thought he was actually on his cell phone, um, you know, trying to, to cover up that sexy mind, right? Um, and we see that and teachers, suddenly they have this opportunity to see their students in a whole new light and um, to maybe, um, have to trigger for them a, a moment of, of thinking outside the box about how, where they might take their, their curriculum next, having been inspired by what happened that day. Well, Rachel, I tell you, I'm so inspired by, by all of this. And, and I have to tell you, um, uh, you know, it, it really makes me think that you're, you're not just creating better students, uh, more learning, active learning, uh, but you're also creating better scientists. And, and that to me is amazing. And speaking of scientists, I, I have to throw this in here. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but um, talk to me about safety because labs are about, should be about safety first. I'm assuming you, you guys talk about this, right? We actually have a mantra, Joe, that is safety first, safety last, safety always. 
And that is something we live by, whether we're in the face-to-face -face lab, whether we're on a field site, um, maybe you say we, we were on the old landfill site. I mean, these are always our mantra for safety. And at home or in virtual environments, it's, it's not different. Um, even virtual reality, reality lab, um, we're thinking about when do you put your safety glasses on? I've got my uh, UV blocking glasses here. Um, so even safety first when you're on your computer all day long, right? Um, so we try to embed that in absolutely everything that we do. Um, and every video that, that you'll see, you'll notice even um, Say, for example, when Liam and Sydney extract DNA, there's a scene where he gets the, uh, the isopropyl alcohol out of the fridge and puts on his safety glasses. Um, so a lot of these are household chemicals that you work with every day, but it's important still to think about safety. And the cool thing about these personalized learning environments is that students are required to think about that on their own. Um, as opposed to say when we have them visit the lab at the university and their waste is out of sight, out of mind, we take care of it for them. Suddenly now we're asking them to have to consider what they do with their own ways. So that learning curve on safety for them is actually, it's, it's, it's a deeper experience. Yeah. Sounds like it. Wow. Uh, two things. I know Joe is all excited about a spa day and, and we've ridden these horses right up to the cliff's edge. We rode fast. And so we're, we're, to, to end this, I just want to thank you for taking the time, Rachel, to share with us. And, and, I, and I hope that teachers reach out and take advantage of this great, great resource. Next week, we saddle up for a conversation about engagement in the classroom with our very special guest, a person who personifies the term teacher leader, 2020 Wyoming Teacher of the Year, Dane Weaver. Oh, Dane Weaver, I know about him. You know, James, you know, he's from Tennessee. Did you know that? And do you know what they sing down in Tennessee, James? Not a, no? Wish that I was on old Rocky Top down in Tennessee hills. Ain't no smoky smoke on Rocky Top, ain't no telephone bills. Rocky Top, you'll always be home sweet home to me. Good old Rocky Top. Rocky Top 10 Wow. Wow. What a note to end on. Next week, Roy Rogers and Gene Autry. Same time, same place. Happy trails to you. Till we see you next Tuesday. <laughs>